The Great Lakes form the largest body of fresh water in the world. And in the 1960s, they developed a serious problem. A little ocean fish called the alewife straggled in through the St. Lawrence Seaway from the Atlantic. At a time when the native fish populations were at an all-time low, especially in Lake Michigan, these little foreigners became so abundant that they outpopulated all other fish. Millions of alewives died and washed up onto Lake Michigan beaches where they rotted. An attack on the alewives came when the Michigan Department of Natural Resources imported over a million coho salmon eggs from the Pacific coast. Hatched in Michigan hatcheries, the baby coho, called smolts, were released in 1966 into Lake Michigan tributary streams. In the fall of 1967, the coho returned to their home streams, 10 pounds heavier from gorging on alewives, and Michigan fishermen were ready. For the first few years, the salmon program was considered an experiment. Dr. Howard Tanner, the man responsible for bringing coho to the Great Lakes, comments on the progress. Actually, the coho program has gone very, very well. It's gone ahead of schedule. There are problems. There are, there are people management problems. There are problems in how to regulate the coho fishery and harvest in the stream. Right now, the mysterious disappearance of part of the coho plant is, has got everyone stumped. Uh, next year, there's going to be a different coho story. And as a part of the problem uh, area is the question of pesticides, which has been prominently reported. It's, a, it's potentially a very serious problem. In 1967, something mysteriously killed over 10% of the baby coho in Michigan fish hatcheries. Dr. Howard Johnson from Michigan State University decided to find out if Lake Michigan pesticides had anything to do with this die-off. Most of the salmon in Michigan are raised in hatcheries, and uh, during this hatchery rearing period, unusually high mortalities of the young fish have been observed. These mortalities could result from a number of, of conditions. Uh, one, of the, one of the problems that uh, we're concerned about is, is that of pesticides. And so we are conducting some research on this uh, I'm working with some graduate students from Michigan State University to investigate the possible role of pesticides in the mortality of the young salmon. To uh, investigate this problem, we've been coming to the various major spawning streams in the Michigan area to take samples of the eggs of the coho and uh, samples of the adult fish for analysis of the uh, pesticide content in the eggs and in the fish. Then we take the eggs that we've spawned out here at the stream back to the laboratory where we incubate the eggs and uh, watch very carefully to see if there is any correlation between the amount of pesticide in the eggs and the mortalities which we observe in the young fish. Dr. Johnson found that Lake Michigan salmon eggs contained six parts per million of DDT. That's four times as much as he found in Lake Superior salmon eggs and 60 times more than in salmon eggs from the Pacific coast. While some of the eggs from each sample were analyzed chemically for pesticide content, the rest of the eggs from the samples were put into incubators for hatching. Such ideal hatching conditions rarely occur in nature. From September on through the bitter winter months, salmon migrate up small streams and tributaries to spawn. A female decides on a spot, and with her tail, she scoops out a nest in the gravel, called a red. Here she deposits her eggs, where they're fertilized by a male coho. Their mission up the stream is then complete. After a few hours, they begin growing weak and start drifting downstream with the current. A few days later, they die and become a part of the stream bottom. As the old salmon spawn and die, thousands of new lives begin in the gravel beneath these spawning streams. It takes about six weeks or longer, depending on the water temperature, for the eggs to hatch. The young salmon, called fry, don't look anything like their parents. They can't even swim due to their yolk sacs, which give them nourishment during their infancy. Gradually, the yolk sacs are absorbed, and the fry grow strong enough to wriggle up through the gravel and into the stream itself. 
At the seven to eight week stage, the fry have nearly absorbed all of their yolk sacs and they begin eating the minute aquatic life they find in the stream. This is when death from DDT occurs, when the last bit of fat in the yolk sac, which holds the pesticide, is absorbed into the systems of these young fish. The fry look healthy, but in a short time they lose their equilibrium, go into convulsions, and die. We have observed a mortality of the young salmon here in the laboratory, and uh, we're continuing to try to determine the cause of this mortality. The symptoms that we have observed in these are similar in many respects to that which we see with fish which are exposed to DDT. We've often been asked what the source of the DDT is that we're finding in the coho salmon and in the Great Lakes. And while this is not a, a uh, primary question of the research program we're doing here, uh, there is research going on to try to answer these questions. Some of the most recent work has indicated that perhaps urban areas are one of the major sources of the insecticide in the lakes and streams. Much of the research work here at Michigan State University is devoted to determining the side effects of pesticides and attempts to develop new and better means of uh, pest control. And it's important that people recognize that these are research programs and that the answers are not developed overnight. Not finding answers overnight is an understatement. The 1967 hatchery die-off affected Lake Michigan coho fry only, and Dr. Johnson's research points to DDT as the most probable cause. But after several years of study, he found that his experimental results were not entirely conclusive. Many other scientists who studied DDT ran into the same problem. Although most people did believe that DDT could hurt the baby coho, no one ever thought it could affect adult salmon. In 1968, the Blackport Packing Company of Grand Rapids, Michigan, contracted with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources to purchase surplus salmon for commercial marketing. There was no way that sport fishermen could catch all the coho in the lake, and most fishermen hang up their rods by October anyway, when hundreds of thousands of salmon have yet to enter the streams. These fish might cause a problem if they all died in the streams after spawning. In order not to waste these fish, the Blackport Packing Company captured the surplus coho and sent them to the cannery. Then, in March of 1969, the unexpected happened. The Federal Food and Drug Administration impounded 29,000 pounds of frozen coho headed for retail stores in Wisconsin and Minnesota. The FDA established five parts per million as the largest amount of DDT allowable in fish for sale. And this coho had up to 19 parts per million. Commercial marketing was halted. No one really knew whether or not 19 parts per million of DDT in fish would have any harmful effect on human health, but the FDA regarded the temporary limit as a precaution. What a turnaround! 25 years ago, DDT was a miracle. In wartime, it saved thousands of servicemen's lives from insect-borne tropical diseases. Then, agriculture began using DDT to protect crops from pest damage. Homeowners used it liberally on the lawn and garden. Forest tree nurseries sprayed lots of DDT, and many municipalities and state agencies used it to control pests in golf courses, parks, and cemeteries. One of the most extensive uses of DDT was for local mosquito and Dutch elm disease control. When it rained, a lot of this DDT washed down city streets, into streams, and eventually into lakes such as Lake Michigan. The drawback of DDT is that it is a persistent or hard pesticide which means it remains poisonous in the environment for long periods of time, up to 20 years. In April of 1969, Dale Ball, director of the Michigan Department of Agriculture, announced that because of this characteristic, DDT was on its way out. Sport fishing continued, however, and fishermen were determined to eat the coho they caught. Oh yeah, of course I live, we live down the southern part of Michigan. We got good fishing all spring long. And we were catching them last week yet. Have you been eating them? Oh, yeah. I smoke them. I love them smoked. Yeah. I used to farm, too, and I ate more spray dope when I was farming than these people ever thought of eating with coho. 
Michigan public health officials studied all the DDT research they could find and concluded that despite DDT's environmental dangers, Lake Michigan coho is safe to eat. Well, I think that we need to be concerned uh, because DDT does have uh, profound effects on our environment and on our wildlife. And I think that uh, all of us, um, even from the standpoint of our health, have to be concerned about this. So I don't think we should forget the problem, uh, ignore it. I think we still have to be concerned. We just feel that these fish don't represent any hazard to health, and there's uh, really no good reason not to use them as food. Researchers found that if fishermen thoroughly clean and cook Lake Michigan salmon, nearly all of the DDT will cook out and leave the fish perfectly safe to eat. Few people doubt this. And while the courts, state, and federal agencies work out the legality of marketing foods that contain low concentrations of pesticides, sport fishermen press on. And despite all this pesticide confusion, the Lake Michigan salmon appears to have come through clean. No unusual hatchery die-offs have occurred since 1967. The coho have been eating those alewives that years earlier had been dying and washing up onto the beaches, and fishermen have been catching and eating the coho. Not only coho, either. Through the hatchery system of raising fish, Lake Michigan anglers have been taking over a half million lake trout and steelhead trout annually, and these fish average five pounds apiece. The hatchery program has gone so well that another Pacific salmon has been introduced to the Great Lakes, the Chinook or King salmon. This monster gorges on alewives for three years before returning to spawn, and it weighs up to 50 pounds. So after some lean years of sport fishing, the Great Lakes have bounced back with more big fish than ever before, and you should hear the fish stories.